sometimes, you know. It's just I can get away with it. I'm the boss. All right. Any questions before we start something new? Okay. Some more, some more technical freehand sketching stuff for today. Yeah. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna test our, uh, our hand drawing skills here. Because we're going to look at a different type of loading. We've been looking at axial loading. Um, we've been looking at, uh, at shear. Now we're going to look at torsion. Torsion is the type of thing that happens in uh, a drive shaft of some kind where one end is twisting it one way. That's our torsional load. And the other end, maybe it's twisting the other way, or maybe it's just fixed. It doesn't matter to us. What matters to us is that the entire structural member, whatever it is, is being twisted. As if you're grabbing one end with uh, each hand and twisting those in opposite directions. Um, we also have a, a different way we might show that. Um, if we use the right hand rule, put our fingers in the direction of the torsional twist, our thumb gives us the equivalent direction if we want to do that. So we can do either of those designations for torsion, but not both. Um, I prefer the, the circular twisty one just because it's more visual that that's torsion. But it also allows us to have torsion and axial loading, which we might do because we are going to be combining loads in a little bit. So remember that's that's uh, the right hand rule that does that for us if if uh, if we want to do that. Some books even put a double arrowhead on it, but then that's just one more thing you got to remember. And I don't know, maybe you've got a brain with lots of room in it and you can remember all kinds of little things like that. I can't, so I like to keep it more straightforward. So uh, I'll use this this picture uh, uh, more often of the torsional loading that looks just like what it is, just like what's going on. All right, so as usual, we're going to take a little look at what's going on inside the material. So we'll make an imaginary cut there to see what's going on on that face that we've now exposed. Where we've got this torsion uh, going on. You can imagine that, well in fact, uh, imagine Imagine you've got maybe a stack of Oreo cookies, which would be just this kind of cylindrical shape, and you twist the top cookie. It drags the cookie below it around a little bit, which drags the cookie below it around a little bit, and as you go down through this stack of Oreo cookies that you're twisting, that effect diminishes until it gets down to the bottom cookie that you're holding still and it doesn't move at all. Each one of those cookies moving over the cookie below it is a shear force. The, the, the layer right in front of this one is being twisted and is trying to drag sideways, trying to drag in a circular way this, uh, this face that we've just exposed. So we'll look at a little elemental piece of that, some little area DA that's a distance, we'll say, rho from the center. You can see what's going to happen. We're going to look at all, all of these little elemental areas. We're going to integrate over the whole face and get the entire, entire deal of what's going on. So as we're trying to drag one layer over the other, that exerts a force on it, maybe something like that, where uh, this lies right in that face. Maybe it would help if we drew another one of these little elemental areas some other distance away, and it's being dragged that way. These little areas 
and each one of these lies in the face and is perpendicular to the, uh, the, the radial direction locating it. And then we've got these little things all over that face, all of these making these radial uh, or these, uh, these, these sheer, sheer uh, forces. If we look right down the face, rather than at a bleak angle, but look right down the face, all these shear forces, if that's our little elemental area that's now on edge because we're looking right down the space, the shear force on that, well, heck, I can't even draw it. It lies right in the face, and, oh, well, that's not going to help any at all. So we're going to have to edit that thing out of the video. That stinks. Hard to draw, uh, as most three-dimensional things are on a two-dimensional surface. But remember that all of these forces are lying right in this face that we've, we've exposed. Uh, maybe if we looked at it on end, that would help a little bit better. So we've got this little elemental face some distance row away. And now there's this force here. Maybe that helps a little bit. Does that help a little bit better? And then someplace over here, we've got this other little elemental area. And it's got a force perpendicular to it. Maybe that helps a little bit more, huh? When you take it next year, maybe I'll have this, this drawing perfected. Anyway, we, we, we need to add all those up because all of those forces and the uh, moment arms at which they act, all of those forces that we add up over that whole face, let's see, those are all little torques. We have a force acting at some moment arm row and we add all of those up over that entire face, each little force, whatever size it is, at whatever radius it acts, that's just a torque, all of those added up is the total load that we've got on this piece. Remember, that's, that's down here somewhere. That's the total load we've got acting on that piece. But each one of those forces is a shear force on that. Some little elemental force working on some elemental area. So we can now take that, put it in there, and we get that the torque will equal the radius where these things are times the shear stress around, uh, across and over that face times the area dA. And then we can integrate that over the entire area of that face and we'll be able to relate the load to the shear stress that the material's feeling. Remember, this is, this is a, a, one of our imaginary cuts inside the material so we can see what's going on in the material. Now we can start to see what the shear stresses are that are trying to rip this material apart as this torsional load is exposed, or it is exposed to this, this torsional load. Now, one of, the, one of the characteristics of this type of deformation that uh, it's undergoing, because it's going to cause this, 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 this uh, shaft to twist, uh, there's going to be an angular deformation. One of the characteristics of this deformation is that these cross sections remain planar. They themselves do not distort. So if we expose this uh, face, or imagine it to be exposed, and then twist this shaft, 
that face that we've uh, exposed stays in a planar shape. In other words, if we are twisting those cookies, well, the cookies remain cookies. They remain planar, but the, the different cookies, the different layers are all dragging over each other, causing this, this shear stress that we need to now look at. So what we're going to do is now uh, now that we've we've sort of looked at things over the over the plane, remember we're gonna we're gonna need this in a little bit, so we'll kind of set it aside. We're gonna come back to that. Uh, now that we've looked at this face to see what's happened, we're going to take a, another look in a different direction. So here's the original shaft. There's the original shaft, the full thing. And remember, we, we took a cut perpendicular to the axial direction to expose that. Now we're going to look at uh, a distance rho and look down the shaft and see what's happening in that way. Again, an imaginary cut inside the material. So, let, let me, uh, it might help if I draw this, this, that little radius out to a point there. It's still the same radius just will be a better reference spot for us if I put it there. Now I'll imagine from that point down the down the shaft I inscribe a reference line. That's just a line from where this radial point comes out that I imagine inscribed all the way down this interior surface that we've exposed. Because when I put a torsional load on this, give it a little bit of twist, what's going to happen is that line is going to displace as this piece twists. This original line will move to maybe here. That line will move to something like that. We get this, this angular displacement as, uh, as this as that piece displaces to there, that, that point displaces because of this torsional load. Well, we've seen this type of thing before. This angle we can call gamma, the shear strain. This angle will be a slightly different one down at this end, and I'll call that that angle. I'll call that angle phi. I don't know what the Greek letter is. I think it's we. This is rho. This is gamma. That's we. I think so. Doesn't matter uh, because we don't actually measure that angle, but it's how we're going to be able to shake out of this the whole shear stress thing that we're looking at so we can start to see just what this deformation is of the material and just what shear stresses it's undergoing. So we can relate those two angles to each other. Maybe I'll call this point A and that point A prime. That's the one that's displaced. So that's an arc length that equals um, rho times phi. It also equals gamma times, well, whatever the whole length of is, is this. That's the arc length 
So I'll make I'll call that L something simple. That's the length of this uh, this shaft undergoing some torsion. And remember that's for small angles. A was the original point here, and then I torqued this shaft and it made A shift up to A prime. It's the, the arc length that that little point displaced. Alright, so now I've got a direct relationship between this, this, uh, this lengthwise strain and uh, uh, an interior uh, displacement, if you will. So we, what we can say is, well, uh, obviously then, it's always nice when that happens, that this maximum angular displacement is going to come when rho itself is at a maximum. So we'll call that, let's see, we've got to give this radius, this maximum possible radius, some designation, we'll call that C. Max radius, well that's obviously the radius of the shaft itself. Because we can't go any bigger than that, there's no material event. No material beyond that. So that's a rho max V over L, but we'll just call that C. That'll be our our symbol for uh, maximum radius, which is the the outer radius of the material itself. We could put that on here. Okay, so rho is, is any radius where we happen to be that's less, that's still inside the material, where when we get to C, we're at the uh, edge of the material. All right, so if we put those two things together, we get then that the shear is uh, depend linearly dependent upon where we are in the material and it will be the greatest at the outside of the material. So if we tend to twist these shafts, they're more likely to fail on the outside than they are on the inside. There's just less going on on the inside, more going on on the outside. And we just need to keep that below the yield strength and uh, we're okay. So let's relate that then to the yield strength. Remember that we have this definition, this, this uh, material characteristic called the modulus of rigidity. That's what the G stands for. Rigidity, I guess, because there's a, a G in there. And that's the um, shear stress experience, remember, uh, sort of like the load over the response of the material to that load. In this case, it'd be the strain. It's very much like what we did with Young's modulus, or the modulus of the elasticity, which was the load over the response only in an axial way. This is in an angular way. So we can use that, relate these two, here, remembering that G is a constant, so we can uh, put uh, that in there for gamma, and we can also put it where we have shear max over gamma max, put that in there for that, 
and we get then that the shear stress is equal to rho C over the maximum shear stress. And we just need to keep that below the yield strength. So there's another piece of the puzzle for us. Um, we got to start tying some things together. Seems a little disjointed at, at times here, but we're getting close. Uh, the deal is with that, if, if we look at that now, it isn't immediately obvious, I bet it wasn't to me, what that relationship actually looks like. Rho is simply the location, if we, if we look on N, Rho is just some distance in the radial direction. Now we're looking down the, the uh, length of the shaft up to a maximum Rho of uh, what we call C. That's the, the outer radius of the material. So C itself is a constant. What this means is that the shear stress is linear with radius. Where at the outer edge we have T max and anywhere interior to that we have a, a, a linear dimension diminishing shear stress to the center and at the center itself there is no shear stress. So that's pretty useful. Uh, 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 it, it makes the analysis easy. We know where the failure point is. We know that it's linear in between. So we can even relate this then to tubular shafts where we have an interior radius C1 and an exterior of C2. So this is a tube. We'll see the maximum shear stress at the outside surface, it drops linearly with that, so we can then predict what the shear stress will be at the inside of that tube. That's important in case we have to have uh, two different materials bonded to each other, um, and then we we uh, you know, have a, a bimaterial tube, we need to know what the shear stresses are, uh, where that, those two materials are bound, uh, bound together, and we need to figure out what's, what, uh, what stresses would be trying to pull those things apart. All right, so we're getting desperately close to something we can actually work with here. So let's go back to this first thing we came up with, where that shear stress is integrated over the entire surface that we exposed, and we know that that's going to be the total load, but we now have that uh, this tau, this shear stress there, is that rho c times tau max. So if we put that in there, we get now that we have the integral of rho squared, so we had a rho here and a rho here, c is a constant, tau max is a constant, 
once loaded, the shear stress, maximum shear stress is determined. That just has to do with the, the location. So we have uh, integral rho squared dA, which is pure geometry. This little beast here is called the polar moment of inertia. If you look at it, it should look very much like the uh, original moments of inertia we define uh, typically in the x and the y direction back in statics. If you're like me, you don't want to redo that integral every time we come up to some circular uh, shaft, so it's, it's uh, done for us. By the way, we call it J. So J for a solid shaft like that integrates. We only need to do it once. No reason anybody needs to do that integration again. Um, One half pi times C to the fourth for a solid shaft. A circular sh solid shaft, by the way. If it was a square solid shaft, it would be a different interval. Uh, I don't know what kind of shaft you'd want to use for torsion that's square like that. Um, but let's add that, just so it's clear. For a circular tube with two different radii like that, it integrates to I C two to the fourth, the outer one minus the inner one. So obviously it's a positive number. Which is a very straightforward calculation to do. Once you do that then, you can figure out what this maximum stress is. Then the imposed load is the maximum shear stress times the outer radius times J. If we need to figure out what it is at some point in between, actually it's more useful up here, I guess, if we do it this way. Actually solve for that shear stress, um, since we uh, often know what the load is going to be, so we just solve for that. T, C over J, or any intermediate spot in between we just go to that intermediate radius, but the other things are a constant. These are the elastic torsion formulae, or as we more relaxed, say in a more relaxed way, the formulas. Okay, it took a little bit to get there, a little bit uh, disjointed, seemed like we had to dance around a little bit to a couple different places, but now we've got the, uh, the working formula we need. So let's imagine some tub tubular shaft here of some kind that we're loading. with a purely torsional load. We're not looking at torsion plus axial loading. We've looked at axial loading uh, last couple weeks. We'll bring it back. Forty millimeter inside diameter 
60 millimeter outside diameter. We'll say this is steel with a maximum shear stress of 120 megapascals. So we've got to stay below that with, uh, with our load. Alright, so do this. Now we, now we can find the torsional load, the maximum load that we can impose. Anything above that will exceed this shear stress and would expect the shaft to rupture. We can also find the minimum shear stress since it's a tubular uh, shaft that will be on the inside surface. Alright, so first thing, well we know what the, the maximum load we can take is. It's from our original form of that elastic torsion formula. So let's put it this way. Because J over C is pure geometry. That has nothing to do with the loading itself. That's nothing but the geometry of the shaft itself still sitting in the, the box at the loading dock, unloaded. So we know that limit on the maximum shear stress. And J, it was C is obvious from the picture, I hope. And J uh, is the polar moment of inertia. So calculate those real quick, double check, make sure that the uh, units are working, get used to some of these numbers. Remember we've been spending some time getting used to real big and real small numbers here and there. Here's the outside diameter. You need the outside radius for C.
Yeah, what are the units on this? Pascal meter. Uh, you know what the units are on on torque. The units on torque are something like Newton meters. Now, maybe we want to do kilonewton meters, mega newton. I don't know. You're going to have to see where these numbers are taken out. Uh, in the English system, foot pounds, or even inch pounds or pound inches it tends to be said that way more often just because the English system tries to get as knuckle headed as it possibly can at all times. So you have to watch all these units. What did you get for J for this? Let's see if we agree on that. Oh, sorry. I did the same thing. Jake, you did ask me about that on the take-home question. I did, did screw it up. Uh, but you just asked too late to change it. It wasn't me. Okay. Well, it was your voice. What? You did. You did. So anyway, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. It was just as you're turning in, it's too late to fix it there, so you had to leave it as it was printed. It just changed the values to a little more absurd. Well, what would you get for J? 1.02. Use the 2 by hope. Got what? 1.02 times 10 to the negative 6 meters. Pat, no? You're not happy with that one? I did mine all together. Oh. Uh, it doesn't hurt to do these type of things separately so that if you make a mistake on any one of them, it's a lot easier to pick it out and fix it. Because if you don't get the same answer as this, 10 to the minus 6, um, it's really easy to fix that. So that's J. So we have units of Newton meter squared and when we divide them by meters we'll have Newton meters units for torque and so divide by C which is the radius in meters I gave it to you in millimeters. Okay, so straightforward, simple, what'd you get? 4.08. Well, what units? Kilonewton meters. Other part you were to find the minimum shear stress. Maximum shear stress. Well, we're limiting that by the uh, the material, uh, or we have some some design limit on it there. Where that number came from uh, isn't necessarily part of this problem. It can be uh, can be policy, can be government uh, uh, guidelines. Uh, could be something from the manufacturer. What's the minimum shear stress? Remember, it drops linearly through the material to the inside, so you just have to reduce this by uh, moving from the outer radius to the inner radius. And you got We're saying that at the outer surface, remember on this on this two, we're 
saying that we have the maximum shear stress out there with this load that we now calculated and it drops linearly toward the center. So you need to figure out what that interior one is, but it just drops linearly towards the center. So is that the big T thing? What? This? Yeah. No. What I, what would the the minimum load would be zero. So just don't load it at all. Right. Leave it in the box. This is the minimum shear stress. The maximum shear stress under this load that we just calculated is 120. In fact, we use that to calculate the load. But that shear stress drops linearly through the material to the inside surface. So out here is the maximum shear stress that was set by this limit and in here is the minimum shear stress. And I wanted you to find that just to drive home uh, that it drops linearly through the material. So at any place we can figure out what the shear stress is because of this linear relation. So like if, if that was if that wasn't a tube, it was just a solid circle, would that be zero? If this was a solid shaft, solid circular shaft, then the minimum shear stress would be at the center of the shaft and would be zero. Okay. It doesn't drop that far because there's no material that right. far. Circular polar moment of inertia. 
and then we're going to do something a little bit different with it after that. Nothing great that we didn't just do, only we have a solid shaft and English units instead of a circular shaft, a uh, tubular shaft and, and uh, SI units. Just to double check. solid circular shaft have a tubular shaft exactly the same amount of material same weight the two shafts weigh exactly the same so outside radius on this one I get a limit uh, limited for you Outside radius, three inches. So it's a slightly bigger shaft, but now it's tubular and it weighs the same as the solid shaft. Now find the maximum allowable load with that. Same 
same material, shafts weigh the same, so there's not going to be any concern about the delivery weights or anything like that. Same, same, uh, same cost other than the cost of manufacturing a tube over a solid shaft. Does it make any difference to the load capacity? Is the shear load? Yep. Same material. Same length. Same length. Length didn't come into it. Right. Kind of a red herring. Same length though here because you need to find the inner radius that will give you the same amount of material as if we took this, melted it down, formed it into a three inch tube rather than a two and a quarter inch solid shaft. So first thing you need to do is find this inside radius so that you have the same amount of material. There's a, it would sure be nice if they would. I don't think it's obvious that they would be. They might be, but if I were you, I'd recalculate it. So let's see. Since the same weight, same material, it's got to have the same volume. Since they have the same length, then that doesn't matter. All they need to do is have the same cross-sectional area. So that'll help make the calculation a little bit simpler. Same cross-sectional area. So you can then solve for the inner radius. I think before I call the outer C2. Yeah. So that'll be C2. You need to find C1 so they have the same weight. Then you need to calculate um, the maximum torsional load. And you have two minutes to do it. Your boss is coming down the hallway. And here's footsteps. C1, then double check with somebody nearby if you're talking to anybody. See if they got the same C1. Then calculate J, maybe double check, and then calculate the maximum load that this uh, shaft can hold. Got it? Were there any decimal points in there? No. Yeah, that's the same thing I got with that. Oh, yeah, there's a space in there. Almost gone? No? Or you're stuck somewhere I can help or just didn't get enough coffee this morning? Yeah. Do five hour energy when you don't have time for coffee. Doesn't work? No? Gee, for five bucks a little bottle, they damn well better work. I guess we won't, now that that's on tape, I guess we're not going to ask them to sponsor this class. Uh, I didn't say whether the J values were or weren't the same. It would be hopeful that they are. It'd be probably a wonderful coincidence if they were in just that a coincidence. So you're going to have to recalculate it.
In fact, uh, you should get a substantially larger J, don't you? Yeah. What'd you get for the inside radius? Yeah, two, two inches. Isn't that marvelous how numbers always come out so nice and round? It's just like that in your entire career. You watch. J, I think, was substantially larger this time. 102 inches to the fourth. Same amount of material, same cross-sectional area substantially larger J. And J is directly proportional to the maximum torsion that this can hold. So if we put everything in, we get, what'd you put in for C? C1 or C2? It's the outer radius. So it's the three inches, and you should get 408 kip inches. So the, the, the shaft is not that much bigger in outer radius, which always helps in terms of uh, the, the load if we push out the radius, but with the same amount of material, we have double the load it can carry. It's much more uh, mechanically efficient to go from a solid transmission shaft to a tu tubular one. In fact, the transmission shaft that runs under your car, well, it doesn't happen as much anymore since we don't have rear, rear drive cars, but pickup trucks are rear drive, so they have these big, long shafts. Those are tubular shafts for this very reason. Same weight, same amount of material, little bit extra cost in manufacturing, but you get double the load that you can carry. Double the factor of safety if that's what you needed. Um, also part of why uh, bicycle frames are made out of tubes rather than just rods. There's a lot of twisting that goes on in a bicycle frame. Um, by the way, if you ever wondered just how tough bicycle racers are, go search, uh, search under bicycle racer world championships or something and see, see what happened to a guy over the weekend in the world championships and track racing. And you'll be convinced that bicycle racers are pretty tough. If you can't find that, let me know. I'll share it with you.